do it yeah by myself uh, i think you already did it the whole okay thing. fine wait a sec uh wait. is it already started or what do it yeah by myself ah okay <clears throat> so hello everyone um I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar to all of you. Uh, Rakesh is an associate professor at NT, uh, NU Norway. His work primarily focuses on scale out servers, hardware software code design processes, memory system design, and runtime code generation and optimizations. So he received his PhD from UPC Barcelona in 2014. During his internship at Intel Barcelona Research Center, he developed memory controllers for Intel Skylake server architecture. Today, he is going to uh, discuss more about the uh, front end bottlenecks that we face in server processors in his talk titled Performance is All About Instruction Supply. And, and I am welcoming Rakesh and I'm pleased to have you here. Rakesh, you can start the presentation. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Rahul. So uh, as Rahul said, uh, in this talk, I will be mainly focusing on, uh, uh, on the front-end bottleneck and what we can do about it. And I will also try to touch upon uh, instruction scheduling and uh, how to find uh, hidden instructions in microprocessors. Okay, so let's get started. So about a de decade or so ago, we saw a shift in computing from conventional desktop machines to mobile devices on one end and the data centers on the other end. And this uh, shift was mainly driven because of Moore's law, as we all know it, because smaller devices were becoming more and more powerful and a mobile device was as powerful as a desktop machine of a couple of years ago. Also at that time, uh, new kind of applications started to appear. Uh, for example, uh, web search, uh, video streaming, social networks, etc., and these the the requirements of these applications in terms of performance, memory, and storage were high so high that they couldn't be uh, run on mobile devices and not even on the desktop machines of that time. So we started building data centers, and when we started to do that, of course, we used the components that we were using for uh, conventional desktop machines, and as we started doing that, doing that, people realized that the characteristics of these new applications or their behavior is very different from what we used to execute before. And as a result, there were lots of inefficiencies in executing those applications with traditional uh, software and hardware stacks. So people started specializing. And we have done quite a lot in that domain. We have addressed a lot of efficiencies, but there's still a long way to go. And in terms of uh, microarchitecture, Google uh, published these results around 2015. And what they show is how these new applications behave compared to traditional applications on, on, on microprocessors. So this graph shows where the cycles are spent while, while executing these applications. So how much cycles are used when we are actually retiring instructions, when we are stuck or stored at the front end, bad speculation and at the back end. And the first thing that comes out of this figure is that the server applications, they are stored on front end a lot more than the conventional applications used to be. So if you look at this, and these are some of the, uh, some of the applications in, in uh, spec which have worse instruction cache behavior. But server applications have even, they spend even more time stored on the front end. So you are not able to supply instructions to the execution units, and that's why you're you are losing performance. Now, this study was quite a while ago, but things have not improved since things have not improved since then. These were the results published again from Google in 2019, and they also show around a quarter of cycles are spent stored on the front end. And then again, in 2019, at Aspros, these results were published that doesn't matter, you design your application as monolithic application or microservices, they spend significant amount of time stored at front end. For example, social networks is more than 50%. E-commerce is again somewhere between 40 and 
And more recently, at ISCA this year, uh, there is a paper that says it's not only the conventional server applications, but also the functions used in serverless computing, they are also bound in the front end. So what all of these results show is that in server application, irrespective of how they are constructed, whether they are server full or serverless, microservices or monolithic, they are all stored at the front end. So why are these applications spending so much time at the front end? What's exactly happening there? So there are at least two main reasons for that. And they both stem from the fact that these applications are huge. They are composed of deep software stacks. And as a result, their code footprint reaches multiple megabytes. And since code footprint is multiple megabytes, there are also lots of branch instructions. So these instructions, they are way beyond the capacity of what you can hold in a level one instruction cache. So what happens? So core asks for an instruction. It's not in the L1. So we need to bring that cache blow from LLC. This takes around 30 to 40 cycles. And during these cycles, we have not issued a single instruction to the backend. Maybe whatever backend had already stopped has also, also drained. So this lack of continuous supply to the backend or execution units result in performance loss. The situation is similar at the BTB end. So BTB is the branch target buffer that identifies branch instructions and provides targets for them. So when core asks whether a particular instruction is a branch or not, and there is a BTB miss, we just speculate that it's not a branch and we execute the follow through path. If it was a branch and it was taken, then after 10 plus cycles, this misprediction will be detected in the core. The core has to be flushed, at least the instructions behind this mispredicted branch. Now, this flush not only, not only results in throwing away, the ta throwing away the work that we did in these cycles, but it also exposes the latency of feeding the pipeline again with the new instructions, which again result in performance loss. So what can we do about this? So if the problem is that these, these structures are not large enough to hold the working sets, why not just increase their sizes? Well, if you do that, the access latency will increase, which will again hurt performance. So this is not a good idea. What else can we do is prefetching. So instead of holding everything in level one structures, you predict what is going to be used in near future and try to bring them into these level one structures before they are actually needed. So this does not require any extra latency and hopefully not area. Uh, so this is a desirable solution. So uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on uh, what was the state of the art when we started working in this direction and what our contribution are, specifically Boomerang, Shotgun, and BTBX. Then towards the end of the talk, I will uh, slightly, slightly touch upon instruction scheduling, how we can make it more energy efficient, and uh, what hidden instructions are and how to find them and what their implications are. Okay, any questions so far? No, we don't have question as of yet. So I think sure. we can. So maybe I'll just continue. And if there is any question, you just interrupt me. Yeah, sure, sure. So I'll, I'm moderating both the questions from uh, YouTube as well as Zoom. So I'll, I'll interrupt you in the regular interval if, if the questions appear. Yeah, perfect. OK, so let's see what was the state of the art at that time. So it's called temporal stream prefetching. And the idea is that as the core retire instructions, you record this retire, retired instruction stream at cache block level, and then you record it in a history buffer. Now, next time when the execution reaches same stage, you look at this history buffer and bring the cache blocks which were executed last time we, we were here, and use this information to fetch these blocks into the L1 instruction cache. Now, since we have already prefetched all of this, now, there won't be any cache misses, and the execution will flow without any misses. So this is great, because it gives us really good L1 miss coverage. But the problem is, this overhead of storing all this metadata can reach in hundreds of kilobytes. In addition, we still have BTP misses. This prefetching, we, have done, we are doing it only for the instruction cache, but there, there, will, be, there, will, be, there will still be uh, branch miss, uh, between misses, which might lead to pipeline flushes. 
But fixing the B2B misses is not a big problem if we have such kind of a prefetcher. All we need to do is put a pre-decoder between LLC and L1. And as you fetch cache blocks from LLC, you pre-decode them to find if there is a branch instruction in that cache block. If you find them, put them into the BTB and forward the cache block itself to the instruction cache. And this way, you have a very good L1i miss coverage. You have very good BTB miss coverage, but we still have these hundreds of kilobytes of storage cost. Now, why does this cost really matter? This is giving us really good performance. And the reason is, uh, the server applications, they have high request level parallelism. And if you can put more cores within one server, the same server can uh, serve more users. So the total number of server required to serve a uh, clientele will be smaller, and that results in lower cost, lower power consumption, and all the benefits you can imagine. So what we want to do is, let's try to take away this storage cost while maintaining high alumni miss and B2B miss coverage so that we can use this freed up space to put more cores there. So let's see what we can do. So if you look at it carefully, how the temporal stream prefetching works is, it records the, uh, the control flow at cache block granularity and then replays it. So our idea is instead of storing this control flow, can we construct it on the fly? So what do we need to construct this? this control flow? Well, the way instructions are executed is one by one. They are executed sequentially until you encounter a branch instruction. So if there were no branch instruction, it was super straightforward. You just prefetch next and blocks and you are good. But since there are branch instructions, they take the execution to different places and that's where uh, your next line prefetching doesn't work. So, to construct this control flow on the fly, what we need to know is where these branch instructions are and where do they take the control flow after execution. So if you look at it, we already have a branch target, target buffer in all the modern processors. And that precisely tells us which instructions are branch instructions. Once we know that there is a branch instruction, we need to predict its direction. That means whether it's going to be taken or not taken. And we have conditional branch predictors that exactly predict or that uh, that are used to predict the direction of a branch. So that's all good. We have all the information in our code that can help us reconstruct these instruction streams that we can use to prefetch. And this is precisely what was done in a very old work more than two decades ago, fetch directed instruction prefetching. It did not have any storage cost. It just used BTB and branch predictor to predict to build this instruction stream and, and prefetch it. So let's take a look at how exactly it works. So we have our core, and this is the branch prediction unit. And what FDIP did is it separates these two components, the core and branch predictor unit, with a fetch target queue. And what it enables is that now the branch predictor unit can work independently of the core. So if you do not have this branch predictor unit, uh, this, this, this uh, FTQ, whenever the core gets stored, that means it cannot fetch anymore, the branch predictor unit also needs to store because whatever it produces cannot be consumed by the core. But if you put a queue here, even if the core is stored, the BPU can still uh, keep producing instruction addresses and queue them in this queue. And since the addresses in this queue are going to be used by the fetch unit, they represent very good prefetch candidates. So how it works is, as you queue these addresses in this queue, you also use these addresses for prefetching. So let's take an example. So let's say uh, we already have something in the queue and the control flow reaches at this point. So since the next block to be executed is, since the next flow, next cache block to be executed from is A, the BPU puts A in the queue. Then a prefetch probe is sent to L1 cache to check whether this block is already there or not. And if it is there, all is fine. Then we see where the next discontinuity is or where the next, uh, next uh, uh, branch instruction is. That's what BTB tells. Then branch predictor predicts it to be taken and VDB tells where exactly it will jump. That says it jumps to cache block C. So we put C in the queue and check whether this is in the cache or not. 
If it is not in the cache, a prefetch request is sent to LLC and you get the block correct from LLC. Now, while we are doing this, while we are getting the missed block from LLC, the BPU does not need to stop. It can still keep on, um, uh, keep on checking where the next branches are and keep on inserting new addresses into the queue. For example, we can say, hey, next branch is here. We give it as this is a call. The direction does not need to be predicted because it's an unconditional branch and it's always taken. And let's say it goes to cache block X. We insert X and check whether this is here or not. So this way, by probing the BTB and branch predictor continuously, we are able to create a stream of instructions that we can use for prefetching. And this is done without any additional storage overhead. FDP uses only the branch predictor and the BTB to construct this thing. So this is cool. It, goes, it gives good algorithmic coverage. There is no storage overhead, but BTB misses will kill the performance. Now in the example I just took, I assumed all of the all of the branches hit in the BTB. But what happens if they don't hit? There are two, two things that happen. First, uh, you can still assume that uh, on a BTB miss, you can just take the whole through path. Miss prediction will be detected in the pipeline and you will flush everything. This is the one thing. And the second thing that, that will happen is you will be prefetching on the wrong path. That means your prefetcher accuracy reduces and your performance will again be limited. Okay, so how do we fix it? So we know the problem is there are so many branches that you cannot fit in the BTB and on each miss, BTB miss for a branch which is taken, you might need to flush, you have to flush the pipeline. Our idea is that whenever you discover a BTB miss, don't go on the fall through path. Rather, to get this branch instruction from the cache hierarchy. Now BTB just told up, hold some information about a branch instruction, but the instruction itself it's somewhere in the cache. So on a BTB miss, go to the cache hierarchy, find that instruction, put the, it puts its information in the BTB and then see whether it will be taken or not. And if it is taken, where will it go? So what do we need to do? First, we need to detect a BTB miss. Second, we need to access the corresponding cache block from the cache hierarchy. And third, extract the branch information by pre-decoding this block and put that information into the BTB. And then we can continue our uh, uh, FTQ filling. So how do you detect a BTB miss? If you have a traditional BTB and you access it with a PC and there is a BTB miss, it can be because of two reasons. First, the, inst the instruction that corresponds to this PC is not a branch instruction. So you don't need to have information about this instruction in the BTB. And second, the instruction is actually a branch instruction, but it's not in the BTB because there was not enough space. So it's really hard to distinguish between these two cases because one of them is a genuine BTB miss and the other is uh, a side effect that the, the instruction is not a branch instruction. So to find BTB misses, what we do is instead of using a conventional BTB, we use what is called a, what is called a basic block based BTB. So, this BTB, instead of being accessed by individual instruction address, is accessed by the address of the basic block. And the basic block is a sequence of instruction that ends in a branch instruction. So every basic block has to have a branch. And if, the, and if there is a BTB miss in this scenario, that means a basic block is missing, that means a branch instruction is missing. So all the misses in this kind of BTB are general BTB misses. Also, uh, the target address is used to index the BTB again, because target address is the beginning of a basic block and it will be then compared against all the tags in the BTB. And if you don't find that tag, that is a genuine BTB miss. So this is pretty straightforward. Okay, so we have found the BTB misses now. So let's see how we use uh, this information to fill the BTB. Again, we assume some of the uh, entries in the FTQ are already taken. Then we reach this point in the execution and there is a BTB miss. We don't know where the next branch instruction is. At this point, instead of taking the fall through path, what Boomerang does is it goes to the cache hierarchy 
and gets the block that contains the branch instruction that we are looking for, or get the basic block that we are looking for. Now, this cache block can be anywhere in the hierarchy. It might be in L1, LLC, or even in the memory. The point is, you just get it from anywhere in the hierarchy. You pre decode it, get the branches, and then fill the next, uh, next, next cache block information into the FTQ, and then you continue. Okay, so how well does it work? Uh, so this is, is the performance number of over uh, uh, several applications, several, several, several database applications, and we are comparing several prefetching techniques. Next line, FD. Shift is a, a temporal stream-based prefetcher, which does only instruction prefetching. Confluence is also temporal stream-based, and it does instruction prefetching plus VTB prefetching. And boomerang is the technique that I just described. So we look at look on average, boomerang matches the performance of conf, confluence. But even though they have same performance, boomerang does not have any additional metadata cost apart from what is already available in the code. Also, there are some workloads where boomerang outperforms confluence, but there are also uh, workloads where boomerang does not perform as well as confluence. And these are the workloads where instruction footprints and branch footprints are just huge. So why doesn't boomerang perform good on these workloads? Let's take a look. So we just discussed that boomerang needs to have BTB hits to, pre to generate uh, cache block addresses that we can prefetch. So as long as you are getting BTB hits, Boomerang is generating addresses, prefetch addresses that we can probe whether they are in the cache, or we can, uh, if they are missing, we can send them uh, for prefetching. So there is this loop. You predict a branch and you use this start gate to again, uh, again probe the BTB. If this loop breaks, that is when there is a BTB miss and you don't know where this branch take, takes us, then Boomerang is stored. It does not know what to prefetch because it does not know where the next branch, the missing branch takes us. It does this thing that it goes to the cache hierarchy and brings the cache, uh, the branch back. But during all this time, we are not issuing any prefetches. And if we can get uh, the missed branch in L1, that's not a problem. We just get three, four cycles stored and we are good. But since the working sets are so huge that it's unlikely that you will get these uh, get these branches uh, in the L1. You need to usually go to the LLC and get them from there. So stalling on each bit, so stalling prefetching under each BTB miss is what is causing Boomerang to have uh, to perform worse than confidence on certain applications. So uh, to summarize, the problem is that the BTB is not able to accommodate enough branches or the branch working set of applications. And as a result, there are BTB misses that store prefetching in Boomerang. So our objective is to improve the control flow coverage or branch coverage in the BTB. And the way we do it is by analyzing the software behavior and then redesigning our BTB for prefetching. So let's understand how the control flow behavior of applications work. So we have two kinds of uh, control flow. The first kind is called global control flow. And this is the control flow that takes uh, execution between functions, or what we call its different code regions. And these branches are usually composed of unconditional branches, calls, returns, traps, and those kind of things. These branches are likely to jump very far from from the branch instruction itself. And then there is a local control flow that keeps the, that keeps the execution within a code region. For example, within a function. So you have a function, you have a loop inside it, all the branches in the loop, or maybe all the if, if else, they keep the execution within the function. So this kind of execute, uh, this kind of control flow, which happens within a code region, we call it local control flow. And it is, it is mostly composed of conditional branches. Now, if we look at global control flow uh, in a little bit more detail, we realize that its working set size is small because there are more conditional branches, there are more branches that keep the execution within a function rather than call and returns. And if we quantify it, 
uh, and this is the results for uh, one of the workloads where Boomerang was not performing well. Uh, the dotted line is if we look only at unconditional branches which, uh, which compose global control flow and the solid line corresponds to all branches. So if we look at hotest 2K branches, which is the uh, capacity of a practical size BTB, we can cover 93% of all dynamically executed unconditional branches. Whereas if we look at overall control flow, uh, global plus uh, uh, local, we are covering only 75%. So what it means is if we care only about the global control flow, we can fit it inside a practically sized PTB. But it's difficult to capture the full control flow global plus local in this PTB. So that's good that if you only care about global control flow, we can just have it in a, in, in a, in a practical sized PTB. So what about local control flow? But because we need to predict these uh, conditional and conditional branches as well, we can't just throw them away. What we observe for about them is that they have high spatial locality. And the reason for that is uh, since global control flow is contained within a region, so the branches are physically located close to each other. As a result, they afford a very compact spatial representation. What this means is we do know if we come up with a spatial representation for them in the BTB, it will take a lot less space than what we are than what they are taking now. So based on these two insights about local control flow, which is it, it favors a compact representation and global control flow that it fits in a practical size BTV, we redesign our BTV. So the idea is to represent the control flow as follows. For the global control flow, you put the unconditional branches as it is in your, in your BTB. The same way they were used in, they were stored in the conventional BTB, we keep them in our proposed BTB design. And then for local control flow, we take all the branches inside a region. So in this particular region, there are two branches and we take them. We Put, uh, we have a special representation for them and we put them next to the branch which brings the execution to this particular control, uh, to this particular region so the bottom line is you save your unconditional branches as you used to save them before and for conditional branches instead of saving the branches themselves you just store where those branches are inside the region which cache blocks are they part of and then later on when we enter that region we can recover these control these branches in a special way that we will see in a way okay so now btb has unconditional branches as it is and conditional branches in a compact form where which tell where exactly those branches is where exactly those branches are instead of what those branches are so let's construct a micro architecture from this idea so we have a btb each btb entry has some metadata information, for example, tag, etc., and a target. And they belong to unconditional branch. For conditional branch, we have this encoded local control flow information. And what this information holds is, is it, it's a bit vector about in which cache blocks the, the uh, in which cache block the branches, conditional branches or local control flow branches lie instead of uh, uh, instead of what exactly those branches are, where they are jumping and all that information. All we know is once you enter this region that starts with this address, we have these cache blocks starting from here that have the conditional branches that we might need. So this kind of information, the conditional branches plus the target footprints for the uh, conditional branches enables very, uh, they, they, they enable very, very high coverage for algorithm prefetch. So let's take uh, an example of how exactly or what exactly we need to prefetch in this particular case. So since the unconditional branch brings us to a target which is in cache block A, we need to prefetch cache block A. Then this bit zero means cache block A plus one is not needed. This bit is one, this says a cache block 
a plus 2 will be needed. So there is a conditional branch in a plus 2. So we will prefetch it and we'll, we will try to recover that conditional branch. Similarly, we need another, another uh, uh, branch, which is in this cache flow. So uh, once we have this information, we go to the alumni, check whether this is there or not. If it is not there, you get it from LLC. While you are getting this, we also have a pre-decoder and a small conditional branch of ATB. And what we do is when we prefetch, we get these branches out, the conditional branches out, send the uh, uh, block to L L1 and these conditional branches to CVDB. So in another, another words, what we are doing is we are able to prefetch by using information which is stored as this footprint. We did not need to wait to construct this information as we were doing it in FDIP or in Boomerang. <coughs> so another way of looking at it is if there is a conditional branch in cache block A which is missing, we do not need to fill that information into the BTB before going on and prefetching A plus two and A plus five. So we are breaking this dependence by means of this bit vector. <coughs> I'm sorry. And uh, CBT can be very small because we only need to fill it with the branches only within a couple of regions and in theory with just one reason. So whenever you enter a new reason, we get all the, all the cache blocks uh, in that region, pre-decode them and fill, fill them into the BTB. Fill them into the BTB. All right. So uh, this is how our new BTB looks like. So we have our BTB for unconditional branches because we want to capture unconditional control or global control flow. And bulk of the BTB storage budget goes to this BTB. What it stores is what we have already seen, unconditional branches, plus the special footprint for conditional branches. Then we have our very small CBTB. This is <coughs> about 20x smaller than the UBTB because we only need to store branches within a region in this CBTB. And then we have our return instruction buffer for return instruction. Now, you can argue that return instructions are unconditional instruction and they are part of the global control flow, and that's correct. But they are special in the sense they don't read their target from the BTB. The target for return branches come from return address stack. So all the info, so a large, part, large, large chunk of BTB will, will go waste if we insert these returns also into the, uh, in, the in the UBTB. So this avoids that uh, uh, storage and utilization. Cool, let's look at the results then. So uh, again, we are comparing here Confluence, which is a storage intensity prefetcher, Boomerang, the uh, FDIP style prefetcher, and Shogun, uh, which is with the new BTB organization. And on average, Shogun outperformed both of them. And if you look at the two workloads that Boomerang was, uh, where Boomerang did not perform well, on one of them, we are reaching the performance of Confluence, which is good. But on the other one, we are still a bit behind, behind confluence. So, and again, the reason is we are not able to capture enough branches in the, in the BTB despite our optimization. So what can we do about it? So let's see where exactly BTB storage budget is going. What exactly are we doing? We storing in the BTB and how? So typically, this is what a BTB entry looks like. You have a valid bit, you have a compressed tag, you have what kind of branch it is, the target, and some bits for the replacement holes. Now, looking at this uh, BTB entry, what comes out is the target field accounts for the majority of the storage cost. So if you want to cram more instruction, more branches into the BTB, we should try to optimize how targets are represented in the BTB. So to do that, uh, what we did is uh, we analyze how far actually branches jump. So how far their targets are uh, with respect to the branch instruction itself. And we are doing this to understand, do we really need 46 bits for all of the branches or some of the branches can be fewer bits. So uh, what this study shows is, uh, so each of the color in this graph represents a different workload. 
And uh, here uh, on the x-axis, we show how many bits are needed to encode the distance between branch and its target. And uh, for a given target, how many branches can be covered is on y-axis. So uh, it, it seems that even with zero bits for target, we can cover 20% of branches. And this is because returns, they do not need any, uh, uh, they don't need any target bits in the BDB because the target will come from RAS. So 20, for 20% 20 of branches, we do not need target bit at the target field at all in the BDB. Then if we have only three bits for target, we can cover 36% of branches. And if we raise it to five bits, if we increase it to five bits, we can cover about 46% of branches. So it seems about half of the branch, for about half of the branches, we need just five bits, whereas we are allocating 46 bits for them. So this is a huge storage underutilization. And as we increase the number of bits, we get more and more coverage. So uh, this study shows us that the target offset of most of the branches can be encoded with only very few bits, which means that the target field in the BDBs is over-provisioned and this study also shows that the target offset sizes are unevenly distributed. What it means is, uh, let's say we say, hey, since with 25 bits, we can cover 99% of branches, let's just have our target field uh, to be sized to store 25 bits. Even though you are way better than storing 46 bits, you are still uh, wasting your space because half of the branches need only five bits and we are having 25, we are talking about having 25 bits for the target field. So what this suggests is we need some sort of uh, adaptability in the target field size to reduce the, uh, to reduce the uh, storage and utilization. For example, if you have only, if you need only five bits for, you, for your target, you should try to use only five bits and uh, not use 25 bits. We need some kind of adaptability here. Uh, and many people have had similar observations and they have tried to reduce the target, uh, target store, the requirements of the target storage. And one of the key observations here is that people have already made is that many targets share the same page number. What it means is the targets of all the branch instructions that lie in the same page they have the same page number, only the offset within the page differs. For example, if we look at these three branch targets, their higher order bits, which represent the page number, they are the same, whereas only the offset within the page is different. So what they do is they store the page number only once for all the offsets. So for all the branches who have their targets in one page, they save the page number once and then they store the uh, then they store the individual offsets within the page. And the micro architecture looks something like this. So this is the conventional, conventional BDB entry where you have 46 bits for target. This field is replaced with two fields. One is offset within the page. And that's next is an index to a separate table, which gives you the page number. So out of 46 bits of target, 10 bits are stored in the BDB entry itself whereas the 36 bits are stored in a different table, which is called a page BDB. So since this BDB is, uh, since there are fewer pages, uh, so this page BDB, ha page BDB has fewer entries and the number of index bits will be less than 36. So overall, instead of having 46 bits for the target, you end up having fewer bits. So to construct your target, uh, the full target, what you do is you take these bits, index uh, the, the page BTV, it gives you the upper 36 bits of the target, lower 10 bits come from the offset. You concatenate them together and you get the full target. So by taking advantage of uh, commonality in page numbers, they are able to reduce the number of bits that are required to represent the target. Uh, State-of-the-art BTB design PDD improves upon that design and they specifically make two observations. The first is similar to the observation made by the prior work that there are different pages that share the same region number. So just like 
there were pay, notion of page and page offset, they add one more dimension of region and region offset. So there can be multiple pages within a region with same region number. So as a result, they store that region number only once and then they have the uh, different region offsets in addition to different page offsets. And the second observation they make is that uh, many branches have their targets within the same page. That means page number and region number of the branch PC and the branch target are the same, which means you don't even need to store the page and region number for the target because you can just recover it from the branch PC. So uh, this is the uh, architecture to explore these, uh, uh, these observations. So instead of storing 46 bits for target, they store a 10 bits for offset, few bits to index page BTV, and few more bits to index region BTV. Uh, the saving they get is from the fact that now each entry in page BTV, instead of being 36 bits, it's only 16 bits. And all the common bits that were uh, earlier in the page in page BTB, they are dumped only once in the region BTB. So just like previous design, they just take these two indexes, go to these BTBs, concatenate the information that they get from them along with offset, and they get the full target. So by exploiting this additional level, we are able to reduce the uh, number of bit required to represent the target even further. Okay, uh, the second observation uh, that uh, some branches have their targets within the same page. To exploit that, what they do is they reserve half of the ways in the BTB for same page branches because these branches do not need to store uh, page number and uh, uh, page target. So this is a different page BTB entry looks like. You need to have offset, page index, and region index. But if the branch is in the same page, you don't need region and page index because you, you can get the information about page number and region number from the branch PC itself. So this, uh, by, by uh, eliminating these two fields, they, are, they reduce the uh, requirements to only 10 bits for the offset or, or, or for the target in this case. Nice. So what are the limitations of this state of the art? They are doing good in a sense to reduce the number of bits that you need to represent a target. Well, the first problem is they introduce a level of indirection. So if you look at this, you need to first access the BTB to get the region and page number, the indexes for uh, region and page. And then you need to do another access to these BTBs to get, uh, uh, to get the information to construct the full target. So there is this level of indirection. And what this means is that now the overall BTB access latency is higher because there are two accesses serialized. And of course, uh, if you want to, uh, th this additional latency might affect your uh, cycle time. And if you want to have it within the cycle time, you need to somehow um, uh, size your BTB and your uh, page BTB and region BTB in a way that you can still accommodate the latency, but that would reduce the number of entries you can save in both of them. And uh, of course, they are unable to address the variability in the branch target distances. So remember, we had uh, this analysis where we showed that there is a lot of variability in, in, uh, in how many bits we require to save the target addresses, whereas these designs, they in a way have fixed number of bits to represent the target. So they, they are less adaptable based on how many bits the target really needs. So uh, to to have a BTB that can be as stored as efficient as we want, we introduce BTBX. And this is based on our insights that we gain from our analysis of branch target distances. So design consists of two things. So instead of storing the targets, we store target offsets. And then to account for the variability, we have differently sized target fields in different ways of the BTB. Let's take a look. So uh, this is the overall design. We have a BTB X and we also have a small conventional BTB and we will see in a moment why. So uh, each entry in BTB X holds some metadata, for example, tags and valid bits and so on. And then the target field in each way has different number of bits. 
For example, uh, zero to eight does not have any bit sort of it because this is a result for return instructions. And then you have gradually increasing four, five, seven, nine, eleven, nineteen, and twenty-one. So this BTB uh, stores only if can store a branch only if its target can be encoded with twenty-five bits. But we also see uh, in our analysis that only ninety, well, not only up to ninety-nine percent of branches can be covered in this BTB. Because they have, they require twenty-five or fewer bits to encode their target. But that one percent that require more than twenty-five bits, for them we have this very small uh, conventional BTB that have target for well, this forty-six bit, not sixty-four bits. And once you have these two things, then uh, recovering the full target is pretty straightforward. You access both of them in parallel, and whichever gives you a hit supplies the uh, offset. And you concatenate that with the PC, and you have your full target. So, in doing so, we are avoiding any indirection. So, in this BTB, we do not have the indirection that state of the art design that we saw previously had. Also, we are accounting for the variability in the uh, uh, in the branch offsets. So, we have differently sized uh, uh, target fields. And we try to allocate uh, the target to the way where uh, it results in uh, uh, least number of bits being uh, wasted. And by doing so, we are able to store roughly 1.3x more branches compared to PDD with the game with the with the same storage budget. Uh, Performance-wise, uh, we are comparing conventional BTB uh, with full targets. Uh, Full size target field, PDD the state of the art, and BTBX this proposal, and we are comparing them across different uh, storage budgets. So one thing which is uh, clear here is that uh, BTBX almost always well always outperforms PDD uh, unless you give it such a high storage budget that almost all design perform about the same. Another thing which is interesting to see is that uh, BTBX, even when given half the storage budget, is able to outperform the conventional BTB. So this is way more efficient than having full 46 bit for target. Cool. Uh, so now we have seen uh, how to build storage free prefetchers and how to cram more and more branches in a given storage budget by optimizing the representation of branch targets. And uh, now we are shifting gears and moving to the next uh, part, uh, instruction scheduling. So we know that uh, out of order instruction scheduling is the most complex stage in a CPU. And it is composed of two uh, sub stages. One is instruction wake up. What it requires is that all the instructions that finish their execution, they broadcast their tags. And then all the instructions which are waiting for their operands, they compare with those tags to see if their operands become ready or not. So this requires lots of broadcasts and lots of comparisons. And then we have instruction selection. So as instructions become ready, we need to first see which instructions have, have become ready and then use some heuristics to select among those instructions and then pass those instructions for execution. And the complexity of these operations increase super linearly with issue width and uh, depth of the issue key. This is because, uh, for example, as you increase your issue width, that means you can execute more instructions in parallel. More instruction will finish execution in parallel. That means you need to broadcast more tags and more comparators will be needed to check if the instructions which are waiting, they, their operands have become ready or not. Similarly, when you increase the queue depth, there are more number of instructions in the queue, more number of comparisons. You need to choose among more number of instructions, so more complexity. So uh, scaling and conventional out of order scheduler is quite complex. So to reduce this complexity, we propose delay and bypass, which is a mechanism that exploits two instruction properties. First is readiness, which means that when you dispatch some instructions to the instruction queue or issue queue, some of them are already ready. That means you don't really need a complex queue to execute them. You can equally well bypass them to a fast uh, in-order queue or a FIFO and schedule from there. 
because they don't really benefit from this broadcast and comparison thing because their operands are already ready. And the second one is criticality. So there are instructions which are not performance critical and you can put them in FIFOs uh, until they become ready and then execute them from that FIFO or they become critical. In that case, you might want to put them to the uh, out of order scheduling queue. Okay, uh, what is the uh, outcome of doing this? So as you are scheduling more instruction or some of the instructions from FIFOs and you are parking some of the instructions in FIFO, the non-critical ones, the total number of instructions that need to go to the out of order issue queue reduces, which means you can make it smaller. Also, as you are issuing some of the instructions from FIFOs, you need to pick fewer instructions from the out of order instruction queue, which reduces the selection complexity. So this is how the architecture looks like. So this is the out of order issue queue, which, uh, which has the functionality of uh, broadcast and comparisons. This is the FIFO for ready instruction. This is the FIFO for parking. So all the instructions which are critical, but not ready, they go to issue queue, out of order issue queue. This is because these are critical instructions and as soon as they become ready, we want them to be available for scheduling. And in the issue queue, out of order issue queue, you can pick instructions from anywhere for execution. FIFO, this is uh, where ready and critical instruction goes. So any instruction which is critical as well as ready will go here. Well, the limitation is you can only pick from the head, but since instructions are, all of the instructions are ready here, there is, this can never stop. Well, unless there is a uh, function unit contention. And then all the non-critical instructions, which are which can either be ready or not, go to the parking queue. And instruction scheduler is able to pick instruction from all of these queues for execution. Of course, it can pick any ready instruction from the issue queue, but it can only pick from the heads of this queue and the parking queue. There is also a path from parking queue to the issue queue, but I will, I will just skip that part. Cool, uh, now moving on to the next part, uh, hidden instruction. So what exactly is a hidden instruction? So any instruction encoding, which is not documented in the instruction set architecture description, we call that uh, invalid instruction. But if this instruction executes successfully, so this, is, this uh, encoding is do not documented in the ISA or it is documented as illegal instruction, but if it still executes, that means this is a hidden instruction. It was not supposed to execute, but it does. And by uh, successful execution, I mean, there is no exception generated or wrong exception is generated. Uh, this might have several uh, security implication based on the behavior of this hidden instruction. Uh, it might actually be, or it or a combination of these instructions might be used as uh, gadgets for uh, return oriented programming. Depending upon behavior, it might be used to overclock the system. Again, it might be able to uh, <coughs> dump the program or even kernel memory. And at the least, it can be used to detect whether your program is being executed on an emulator or it's executed on real hardware. And this is uh, quite important because uh, <coughs> if you are able to detect that you are, uh, your code is actually being emulated, not executed on hardware, you might want to selectively execute malicious code. So if you detect, hey, I'm running on real hardware, so it's hard to analyze my binary, I can launch an attack. But if I'm running on emulator, there are several things that emulator can do. So it's probably a good idea not to launch that attack. So this emulation detection uh, enables selective uh, malicious code execution. Okay, uh, so to do to, to, to uncover this hidden instruction, we uh, have a tool which is called Arm Shaker. This is uh, publicly available. If you want to work with it, feel free to download and try it. And the way it works is that we generate instruction encoding. Uh, in theory, we should only generate encodings which are marked illegal or undefined in the instruction, uh, instruction set manual, but we can generate for simplicity all possible combination of instructions. Then we pass them to a uh, disassembler and check whether the disassembler has been able to successfully disassemble it or not. If it has, that means this is a valid instruction because it has been disassembled. But if it is not disassembled correctly, then we try to execute this instruction. 
if the execution succeeds, that means no illegal signal uh, inter, uh, exception is generated. Or oh, if it is generated, then it's fine because that is the desired behavior. If you execute an undefined output, you should generate this exception. And if this exception is not generated, rather no exception is generated or a wrong exception is generated, you know the result for the further analysis. So we ran this tool on uh, several uh, systems, both uh, real hardware and uh, emulators from different vendors, implementing different uh, instruction set architectures. And uh, the results show that all of these systems have some form of hidden instructions. One interesting finding was that these instructions, which are hidden, they were not really hidden in hardware as such. They were mostly because of the bugs in the system software, specifically in the Linux kernel. For example, instead of generating uh, illegal instruction exception, a different exception was raised. Uh, also, there were bugs in QMU, and these, uh, these bugs are mainly in the QMU decoder that were making an illegal instruction to behave as vector multiplier vector addition instruction. Uh, we have also um, submitted the patches for the Linux uh, uh, bugs, and they have been accepted or under consideration. Okay, to summarize, uh, we have seen that uh, front-end bottleneck is a critical uh, uh, problem in the servers. And uh, irrespective of whether you have a monolithic application or microservices, conventional server full applications or serverless computing, front-end is a bottleneck in all these scenarios. Temporal screen prefetchers work, but they have huge storage overhead. And then we propose three systems, Boomerang, which uses only in-core BTB and uh, uh, branch predictor to fill the alumni and BTB. We, pro we, uh, we introduced Shotgun, which has a specialized BTB organization based on that is based on the control flow behavior of applications. And then we uh, propose a specialized BTB design to represent the branch target with the fewest possible bits. So uh, that was it from my side, and I will be happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Rakesh. Thanks for the very detailed presentation, and I really liked it. So uh, I would ask uh, the audiences if, if they have uh, uh, some questions. So uh, maybe, yeah, I, I can go on actually in, in the meantime. So I have some few questions. Sure. So I, I, I really like, and then uh, the, the, especially the last part that, that you mentioned, right? There's some, some hidden instructions which are not at all uh, documented anywhere in the ISA, uh, let alone the uh, software manuals that the manufacturers provide, right? So, and, and then you have successfully managed to, you know, find uh, instructions in uh, some, some platforms uh, nonetheless, right? So, so that let, makes me believe, like, can we exploit these instructions in some way to, you know, dodge security in, in some, some way, or, or these instructions are mostly benign, like they, they do exist, but then we cannot, you know, engineer them in such a way to, you know, exploit them in a security vulnerability way. Uh, it would really depend upon what functionality does the hidden instruction really provide. Mm -hmm. If it just adding two numbers, then it's probably, it's likely to be benign. But if it somehow overrides the, uh, Privilege levels, or it it let you change the uh, if it let you control the DVFS, then it certainly uh, is going to be a problem. But even if it is an add instruction, it might still uh, help you to discover whether uh, if you are running your code not on your machine but on a remote machine, whether you are uh, running on a virtualized emulation system or you are directly executing executing on hardware. For example, if you know uh, a certain emulator has a bug which is manifested as hidden instruction, you try to execute that opcode. If that opcode executes successfully, then you know you are running on an emulator, not on the hardware. And you are assuming that hardware does not have the same problem. I see. Uh, so in that case, you know you are running on an emulator, emulator and people are probably able to analyze what you are doing. So uh, in that case, you can probably say, hey, now somebody might monitor me, so let's don't do the things that I wanted to do. 
And if you, if that and if that generates an exception, you know you have not been emulated, then you can do whatever you want to do. I yes, yes, I know, yeah. Perfect. So I have I have one question from the audience also on the same direction. So mm -hmm. uh, so one of my colleagues he wants to know like uh, in, in in that simulation environment that you uh, tried out to find this this instructions undocumented instructions right. So uh, is it limited to uh, like mobile systems or what what was your experience like or or let's say in, in proper desktop class uh, or let's say server class have, processors also have the same problem. Or I should not say problem, maybe like the same same behavior. Yeah. So we ran it only on uh, mobile devices, uh, but this tool should be able to run on any machine which has our V8 instructions at our touch. I see. And running Linux. And running Linux. Because, okay. yeah, because our tool has some, uh, it uses some features of Linux. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was there any reason for, for you to specifically target mobile devices, let's say? Uh, I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think why he did that. So this was this was the work of my master student, and he had only six months to do this. So probably he did not get hold of a desktop machine which had ARM processor, whereas getting it on the mobile devices was super easy. So probably that's the reason why he chose to run it on the mobile devices rather than desktops. Yeah, but perfectly understand. I mean, I don't see any limitation why it won't be able to run on desktop. I see. I see. Yeah, it's perfectly. This is the only thing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just from, from our side. Is, uh, yeah. Okay, so do we have any other questions from the audience? Or maybe... uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, this is Nika here. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have two high-level questions uh, overall regarding uh, the front-end bottlenecks that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So my first question is that um, in your experience or based on what you've studied, uh, what degree of front-end bottlenecks in uh, today's workloads could have been uh, potentially prevented uh, or alleviated with uh, better, let's say, ideally better programming practices? Mm -hmm. So I would say there are two aspects to this. One is, in a way, we are using these programming practices to propose what we are proposing. For example, the BTB design of short gun is in a way motivated by these programming practices that your function should not be very large. So that's why local control flow is very, can be presented in a very compressed form. Now, the another question would be, can I optimize my binary in a separate way? And I assume, yes, that's possible. And that's in a way is what, uh, uh, how, does, uh, how do you call that thing? I don't know, there are software binary optimizers. What they try to do is uh, try to make sure that uh, uh, when you have an instruction cache block, most of the instruction in that block are executed rather than a fraction of them. So I believe there are certain code layout optimizations that can help, but given the functionality of the application is so, uh, so de you know, detailed, the, the, the functionality is so uh, huge in a the sense they provide so much things you can do with the application. It's really difficult to to reduce that functionality. I mean, of course, there are things that you can do is like compressed instruction formats, but it's hard to say that even they would fit in L1 instruction cache. You see, yeah, that uh, makes sense. Uh, and I think that also it will be interesting that as let's say computer architects, uh, we compile, let's say, set of coding practices or like set of, I don't know, rules to follow at least for the user level or like maybe in the compile level, or as you mentioned, change, changing the binaries. Yeah, so, so, I'm like, yeah, so this, uh, the way it is like, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, if all instructions execute sequentially, there is no front end portal, like you can just prefetch everything. So if you can somehow make sure that most of the code is code layout is such that you execute back to back and rather than jumping here and there, then probably you can uh, at least mitigate it to some extent. Or at least, uh, but then it becomes a problem because if, if you can tell, hey, this is how my prefetcher works, this is, these are the conditions in which, under which it will perform better, you try to, uh, uh, you try to make your layout 
which can be better noticed by this prefetcher. But that is again going back to BLIW kind of thing. You are exposing too much hardware microarchitecture architecture to the uh, compiler people and, uh, and your code in a way becomes platform specific. So I think that's not really the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are always like, uh, these like, strong trade-offs uh, in yeah. both sides. Um, so now we talked about, uh, let's say hints we can provide uh, from hardware perspective to programmers, but do you envision that uh, like some cross-layer solutions that the programmers provide hints um, so that we can handle these uh, front-end bottlenecks more efficiently? Uh, by that, I don't mean that, um, by hints here, I mean that mechanisms that would be a, so that programmers can uh, encode some information about what they expect from their program to do like based on different use cases or based on different input mm -hmm. scenarios so that they would encode some hints so that those hints could be kind of like translated by hardware to alleviate some of these uh, front end bottlenecks. Of course, that requires like a very expert. Yeah, uh, this in, in a way goes to like, uh, maybe not profile guided optimization, but I mean, in hardware is, you can also have a hardware prefetching policy that gets some information from software, certainly you can do that. And uh, because some things are uh, straightforward for hardware to prefetch, something it just cannot. So things that hardware has a difficulty in prefetching, those things, if uh, you can get some, maybe some kind of uh, software prefetching instructions, uh, they can certainly aid, aid the hardware prefetcher. Maybe just say, hey, this region of code, don't even try it because I have put, in a way, let, let me just try to tie it to a uh, temporal stream prefetcher kind of thing. So one of the problem there is it tries to get the uh, trace of full application. So if you can say, hey, this portion of my application, I am generating software prefetches and I know these prefetches are pretty accurate. So you don't need to do that. So the amount of metadata that the temporal stream prefetcher would need to store would get reduced. So in, in that case, that would give uh, some efficiency over there. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So thank you very much for the answers. Uh, and so th uh, then my second question um, would begin like, uh, I think it's a high level question mm -hmm. and also um, about the title of the talk or like the direction that like the uh, of course, the increasing importance of uh, front-end bottlenecks on several workloads that you mentioned and instruction supply. So um, based on the trends, like which one do you think is more important for going into the future, the instruction flow or data flow delivery? So even if you have a perfect instruction stream, uh, performance can be still like uh, highly exacerbated in existing systems due to data flow. Um, and like data flow systems are even like less instruction they focused. So more um, dependent on data flow. So what do you uh, envision? Um, so are you referring to the first chart where they say there is a, the, the, the applications are stored in the front end as well as the back end. So you're asking which one of them is more important? Right, as in like uh, um, based on, uh, so because like, in the title, like we're emphasizing here that oh, the performance is all about instruction supply. Mm -hmm. So what do you observe or like, what do you think about the trends here compared to like data supply and instruction supply? So one thing is data has anyhow, the data set has anyhow grown so much that they don't even fit in LLC. So in a way, what people are trying to do is uh, for most of the data, they are just streaming or they are just directly going to LLC or what you guys are doing with uh, PIM-based systems. So, so data has already always been a problem and it will, seems it seems that it will stay a problem for the foresee foreseeable future unless uh, those PIM kind of systems take off and uh, you can reduce the bottleneck to some extent. But, that problem we have known for a while, and we have a lot of mechanism to address that problem. Not only prefetchers, but look at the out-of-order code in a way that was designed uh, so that even if you have a cache miss, you can execute that instruction and somehow uh, hide that cache miss. We don't have so many mechanisms in the core front end, and that's because we have never, well, 
in the conventional application, at least we have never had this problem. For example, in HPC, most of the uh, instruction marking sets we didn't have one and you never need to worry about that. So L, uh, the data side has always been a problem. We have lots of solution done and we and, and it has attracted lots of attention. Instructions are now becoming a problem. So we need to start focusing on that aspect as well. Of course, it's not like if you solve this problem, you get more benefit from that. Might not happen because as, as soon as you solve this one, your bottleneck shifts there and you need to solve that one as well. So as far as which one we should address, of course, we need to address both. In what Thank order? You know even if you have a perfect backend, which is not the case that we have today, if you are not able to, able to supply instruction, doesn't matter how good your backend is, you won't get good performance. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nika, for the questions. So uh, I think um, I have a couple of more questions from my side. If, if no one wants to chime in first, then I can I can keep talking from my side. No, actually, uh, uh, Rahul, I can ask uh, one question. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. David, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, uh, David here. So, Rakesh, uh, thank you very much for the very insightful presentation. So, I was wondering, like, you started saying, like, there, there are, like, these front-end limitations, no, on today's uh, approaches, like, after having implemented all these optimizations that you are suggesting. So, there is still a problem with the front-end. And if so, uh, so can you give an idea of like where the problem lies now, now that for instance, BTB misses is no longer the main issue, right? Yeah, uh, so there is still problem and it's not like we have eliminated the urban component of the misses or the BTB portion of the misses. We are able to grab more and more in, but it, our prefetches are still not perfect. And, and the reason is, in a way, for FT, the, the prefetcher not being perfect, the reason is BTB. If you have a perfect BTB and a perfect branch predictor, you can have a perfect prefetcher. Yeah, so, that, that was my intuition, actually, because yeah, you never talk exactly. about the, 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 the prediction accuracy that you are considering, no? Yeah. So, like, yeah, please elaborate, if you can. So, so, so to have a perfect prefetcher, we need to have a perfect, perfectly, perfectly prefetcher perfectly predicted instruction stream. And what limits us from uh, having that accuracy? Two things. We need to find out where the branches are. That means we need to have a large enough BTB. Second, we need to know where those branches are leading us to, whether they are taken or not taken. BTB is not good, large enough. So uh, at least for the traces that we have, if we have a 32 k entry BTB with one cycle latency, that's the perfect. But we are far from that, even with all of our optimizations. Uh, branch predictor, you have sometimes maybe 95 plus uh, uh, percent accurate. But even if you mispredict one branch, you see that effect. Well, not necessarily all the time, but you are likely to go on the, miss, uh, on the wrong path for prefetching. So if you can have these two perfect, you can have a perfect run today. Hmm. But like in with this respect, so like because I see you are using the target branch predictor kind of in a different way as they are supposed to work, no? Like because you are like a kind of running ahead, not so attacking prefetch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with this in mind, wouldn't you like tweak the branch, uh, the, the the target branch predictor in a different way that you could have some soft information to know up to what extent you can be aggressive on the prefetching or not? Well, certainly, uh, we do that. So we don't really go uh, a lot ahead. We, we size our queue in such a way that we can prefetch enough, but no, we don't go so ahead so that we are prefetching a lot on the wrong path. <laughs> OK, I see that. Yeah. And, and then I had a second like, question. Like, it was like uh, based on the motivation, because yeah, I, I'm getting like some sort of like sometimes contradictory trends, no? Like you're saying, like we need to optimize a lot for area, no? Like you are, you you did a lot of like uh, low level optimization so that you could fit more into mm -hmm. like uh, your memories. Yeah. And at the same time, we see that like recently, like they are coming these like monstrous chips, no? Which uh, they have every time more SRAM, so they they have like it, you have the the impression that SRAM comes for free. At the same time, shall we still like optimize so deeply this kind of uh, memory? You see, like my. Mm -hmm. 
might be because of what market segment you are targeting, uh, for example, in servers. Yeah, like like for instance, data, like data caches are less effective. So people are actually throwing away L2 caches because mm -hmm. they don't really serve and practically any purpose. So what, what they are trying to do is have as many cores as you can fit, have good instruction supply and a fast path to the network and off chip components. Because anyhow, most of the data you need to get from off chip, even LLC does not hold a good amount of data. So and uh, so more chips you fit on a, on a, on a processor, uh, sorry, more cores you fit on a chip, the more users you serve with the same server. And uh, so that's where the area efficiency comes in. Okay. So and of course, there are other people who are looking at uh, this area efficiency, not to put more cores, but probably more accelerators, because they are looking at a particular domain where accelerators are more beneficial. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you're saying like uh, let's trade off like uh, L2 and extra memory by more cores, and we enable them in a different way, like by a if, better front end. If that extra memory does not benefit you, yeah, yeah for the segment, anyway. for the segment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, David, for the questions. Do anyone have any other question? Okay, maybe I can join him. So uh, uh, Rakesh, I have one like peculiar question. It's a kind of like a retrospective and just a, like a question uh, might not be uh, founded by some scientific observations, but just observation from a user's perspective. So like large PTBs with a large enough uh, L1i cache makes sense for a server class applications, which has a very deep software stack uh, running on, right? But then like commercial processors like what Apple came up with with a one right that we are seeing 192 kilobytes of l one i cache, which is at least uh, yeah I mean I think three to four times higher than what the competitors have in the market right I mean 32 KB is normally what we see in Intel or AMD processors. And then there are other reports also which claims that okay maybe there uh, BTB is also uh, size somewhere around four to eight kilo entries. So what, like from your perspective, who, who is doing research on this direction, what might make them take this decision for even a, a user grade product like uh, that might go into our laptops rather than a server? Do we, is it motivated by just a, a brute force solution to the front end or maybe they, uh, they, it might be motivated by different applications, which we as a researchers might not have hold on, let's say JavaScript or web-based applications, which runs on browsers, right? So this application uh, domain is exactly what I was going to say, because if you look at it, it's the huge instruction footprints, they are not only problems for server applications, they are also problems for things that you run on your mobile phones. So if you look at, well, Samsung had this had these traces and that they showed that instruction cache the, or the front end bottleneck is uh, a big bottleneck for them as well. Now, it might actually be an effort to alleviate this problem with 192 or 198 kilobytes of uh, element cache. But, and of course, uh, there, are, oh, oh, there are lots of processors which have BDBs of uh, even 28 and 48 kilo entries, but it's not a single level uh, BTB. You have multiple level BTBs, and the first level is optimized for latency and then for capacity. But what is interesting in the Apple design is their album cache is such, such so huge. So they do, I'm not sure if they say it, it's not clear how their, their latency is. Somehow, if they pipeline to account for that latency or not. So or maybe they have they are able to tolerate high latency, but their high uh, hit rate somehow still provides benefit over over come over uh, giving up on latency, right? Because mm -hmm. if your latency is low and you always missing in, in your L1 cache, that's also kind of useless. But if you say, hey, instead of four cycles, I'm going to spend six cycles, but now my hit rate increases significantly, maybe it's worth the trade off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always latency versus hit rate, the, the, the trade-off that we make, right? But yeah. it, 
it's just like from from a, as i said like it's it's not a scientific observation sure. it's just an observation. So, so i would say yes, maybe their applications it makes sense to have this trade of the other way around or, or or yeah i mean the the scientific uh, let's say a point of view that i'm i'm i was trying to get here is that are we as a researcher are we missing out all workloads that we should look for that made them take these decisions or let's say yeah i i mean let's say the traditionally what what the programs that we uh, live and breathe in in, in micro architectural studies which are mostly written in c++ right i mean pick pick spec pick parsec pick any any workload traces that we have more more or less they are written in either c c++ or maybe i mean at max java right uh, or if they are targeting different type of uh, let's say software stack and would that made them believe that okay maybe some some the the bottleneck lies somewhere di- in a different way so maybe we need to tweak the design in a different way certainly i agree with you on this point that like the benchmarks that have that that we have traditionally used are written in c and c++ and they are super optimized for one kind of architectures and uh, scripting languages they are a completely different domain and optimizing those things certainly requires different architecture decisions and optimization trade offs so i totally agree we should start or i suppose people are already at least some people are already looking at them and we should certainly take into consideration what kind of uh, programming languages we are uh, uh, using for the workloads that we are trying and uh, what kind of workloads we are executing yeah certainly Yeah, and it makes sense. Yeah. So I have uh, I have two more questions on 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 the uh, the the uh, the shotgun and the uh, boomerang side. So mm-hmm. so it's 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 different. Uh, let's say. So have you have you tried to look at um, like instruction uh, the control flow information that that uh, that that um, uh, the, the the shotgun leverages right? So you you have a unconditional. uh branch information and then mm-hmm. one conditional branch information followed by a, a spatial footprint of the conditional branch information correct so have you tried to kind of you know map it down to let's say data flow information also so what i'm trying to say is that let's say uh if you look into each function right so uh, and so you you have the program is basically a collection of functions right and then within each function you have let's say short loops and within that loop you would have let's say two three load instructions which are uh, their, their behavior is predominantly defined by what that loop is right so if it is a double loop or let's say if it's an indirect loop then then that that load instruction is probably trying to jump indirectly or maybe that load instruction would generate memory uh, memory addresses which has a strided pattern which has let's say two strided pattern three strided whatever it is so what i'm trying to say is that is there a way or what do you think of of uh, let's say exploring the possibility of tying the data flow information to the control flow information to make the data flow prediction also as accurate as let's say control flow information I mean, okay. you, so so basically, we're saying, can we use what we have not only for instruction prefetching, but in a way also for predicting what data elements will be used? Exactly. So so let's say for like the typical problem that we have for data prefetcher is like the prefetchers are good in terms of uh, understanding complex and ever complex patterns for like la last thirty years or so, right? But then. what it lacks behind is that when it w- has to stop learning right so so let's say you have to in like the memory accesses are entangled with each other right so you need to detangle them first understand that okay this f- flow is having a strided pattern that flow is probably just piggybacked on this strided flow so that's an indirect pattern so once you get that understanding then you can actually say that okay this can i can predict by this algorithm that flow i can predict using some other algorithm or or let's say this uh, algorithm can be useful for this type of flow so like the the most intuitive way of detangling this data flow information can be just to map it back to the control flow information right that okay we have called a function 
there is a past behavior that, okay, within this function, I have seen that there are three load instructions. One of them are strided pattern. Another one of is an indirect uh, pattern on the strided pattern itself. Another one is strided, but it's a, let's say two stride repeating. Let's say plus one, plus two, and then plus one, plus two. So how you remember this, you remember this using saying that, okay, remember the function first, like who called this function. And then within that function, you remember the spatial footprint also that, okay, for this conditional branch, it used to be this type of data flow. For other conditional branch, this used to be this type of data flow and so on and so forth. So basically it's a representation of the program, not only from the control flows perspective, but also the data flows perspective, which is tied to the control flow, right? And then your predictor engine is simultaneously predicting the control flow, right? I mean, that's predicting the instruction delivery as well as it's piggybacking the data delivery on top of the instruction flow. Uh, so what I can say about this is like one thing that certainly can be done is when to stop refetching. So because what we are doing at the front end is not necessarily with this BTB design, but with any BTB design, mm -hmm. uh, you are predicting which instruction will be fetched and as a consequence executed. So once you see this particular load, is executed three times only, and then the control flow changes and you skip over it. Then you can say, hey, the data prefetcher, don't prefetch more than three elements because we are going to execute only three times for mm -hmm. this particular PC. So, so that, that means there is possibility to take some hints from the uh, instruction flow delivery engine and transfer that information to the data flow delivery engine to you know, basically like co-learn somehow together to make the data prefetch. At least it would, uh, it would make the aggressiveness of the prefetcher correct. Correct, yeah. Or at least it will control it to some extent to not to overfetch. Makes sense, yeah, makes sense. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, any, any sort of that type of like directions that, that, that I, I was kind of thinking along. Perfect. Sure. Uh, so one more question that I have is that uh, like you, you have like, briefly scheme through that part. So I, I'm trying to, like, I haven't actually gone through that, that the serverless paper that you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. that coming up in ISCA 2022. So I had like writing the question on that direction itself. So, so let's say now when we are moving into the serverless era, right? So it's just a function as a service rather than anything else, right? How you envision this front end engines of uh, like instruction delivery engines of core would change to accommodate this type of short-lived uh, serverless functions. Like, I mean, they might come up again and again, but then you have very less time to, you know, learn from them and at, at the same time to, uh, you know, predict for them basically. <laughs> so that is a, uh, uh quite a challenge in the sense, because sometimes what might be the smallest functions, you just don't have enough time to, to learn anything. For example, even with FDIP, you need to train your branch predictor and one of your BTV so that you can actually start your prefetching. But if the function is so small that you execute these things maybe once or twice, you just don't warm up anything. One mm -hmm. thing uh, that can be done is, so you take this snapshot for memory and then you uh, reload this snapshot when you run the function again. And these are the snapshot of architectural state. If you can take snapshot of microarchitectural state as well, maybe not the full microarchitectural state, not what should be in the L1 and what should be in the uh, LLC, you just take what is the state of a warm up prefetcher or what the prefetcher needs to start prefetching again from the correct place. If we can store that state along with, along with the architectural state in the snapshot and then we have some mechanism of reloading it, we can avoid this time that we need to uh, train our prefetchers. And if you have a, uh, if you can refill that thing and you got to train prefetcher, then probably you, know, you can do uh, better prefetching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense. And again, it, and I assume this state should be a fraction of what is already stored for uh, architectural state in a snapshot. Uh -huh. I see. 
so is it is is it even uh, um possible to let's say learn the instruction flow delivery uh, cross functions like so what do i mean by cross no, functions i'm like, saying not across functions for one function you still but cross invocation right so yeah, yeah exactly cross invocation i think that should be the way Ah, so you're yeah. saying like the same function coming across by a different invocation. So we are learning when one invocation and then basically using the same uh, information. You're using that information for the second invocation. Yeah. It, it, is it even possible to, or, or let's say, does it make sense to expect any in, uh, similarity across functions also? Uh, maybe not across functions, but different invocation of the same functions. Different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There, there should be similarity. Okay, so so basically we can, yeah, either either checkpoint this with this uh, uh, states or maybe we can just represent it in a very uh, like a footprint style information and then use some some ID of this function to store this information. So whenever it comes back, we use the same knowledge again instead of learning instead of learning it again. Learning again. Okay. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think I think that's that's I have one very li little question, but yeah. Sure. <laughs> so uh, so the, the, so the for third the, the 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 instruction scheduling work that you mentioned there. So I I, I noticed that you use the term criticality. Mm -hmm. So can you can you tell us like what exactly? There can be definition? a lot of definitions of criticality. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular that we uh, in this particular work that we did the only the simplest definition we use in a way simplest definition if an instruction is a memory access instruction or it leads to a memory access instructions those are critical instructions and the reason why you why we use this definition was uh, because mlp is super important in many workloads and mlp is generated by memory access instructions but you cannot execute a memory access instruction until you have the address ready. So all the instructions that lead to the uh, memory access instruction, that means it's address generators, they are also equally critical. So if an instruction falls under this category, market critical, otherwise that's not critical. This may or may not be the right definition because there are lots of other things that that, that, that might happen. Maybe, that, maybe this load is not on the critical path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the, the correct definition was there is a very old paper 20 years ago. They made the critical path of whole applications in one uh, uh, in one uh, during one execution and during the second execution. They showed that if you mark all the instruction only on that path critical, that gives you very good performance. And then there was a heuristic of without storing that information beforehand, how can you predict that you are going on the critical path? Yeah, I think you, you, you're trying to point uh, the the Brian Fields paper. The the can't remember now. Okay, yeah, but but, but yeah, yeah. But I I think that yeah. So my my concern was also coming from the same uh, direction. Is like yeah. I mean, uh, there are multiple definitions one can come up with uh, regarding the criticality, right? I mean, one can say that okay, it's a, it's critical. Uh, I would term one instruction to be critical if it is on the critical path, right? have a token passing algorithm or any any algorithm as such just understand whether this instruction is on the critical path or not right or uh, or maybe what uh, 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 like someone can also think of let's say criticality in terms of other uh, applications let's say energy consumption or maybe uh, i mean fairness for, for performance but for energy yeah, sure yeah i mean it's it's like a very broad term mm -hmm. uh, that can be defined by uh, as as anyone wishes right so so yeah i mean that but, but the idea of this work was doesn't matter what your definition is definition is it's yeah. it just, if instruction is critical it should go to it should by your definition instruction is critical it should go to this 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 queue makes sense makes sense yeah yeah makes sense so yeah, i i think that's that's it from my side and uh, yeah thanks again for for answering all the questions i mean i am yeah, really yeah. happy to uh, yeah sit through the the the, the talk so do we have any any other questions from the Zoom audience or maybe uh, any question from the YouTube audience? Uh, feel free to uh, discuss, we will, we will.
Okay, I think we don't have any other questions uh, from the audiences. So, so yeah, I think, I think, I think, yeah. So, so we can we can wrap it up then. Uh, thanks, Rakesh. Thanks again for the insightful talk, and, and I, we all really enjoyed the the uh, this sort of uh, uh, like research in general, right? I mean, it's a microarchitecture, and then. Yeah, not many people are doing microarchitecture mm -hmm. research nowadays. So, so it's really good to uh, see uh, different perspective from different researchers also. Thanks again. Thanks again. Well, thanks for inviting. Talk. It has been a pleasure talking to you guys. Yeah. And, and thanks everyone else who joined the call over Zoom, over YouTube for joining with us. And we'll see you soon in the next uh, seminar series. Uh, otherwise, I will see you in August. Hopefully. Perfect. Okay. Have a safe time, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a nice weekend ahead.